the tail end of a great week. Uh, my name is Frank Brown, and I'm pleased to and privileged to be able to moderate a great panel this afternoon on the DNA of, of global growth companies. Uh, the panel, I think you, you know everyone, uh, but Kevin Kelly, who's the chief executive of Hydric and Struggles, has, uh, has joined us. He's not in your program, so thank you, Kevin, and, and thanks to all of you for, for joining us. We have a, a very distinguished group, and we have, I think, a, a very important topic and a lot of perspectives on this topic. What really drives the success of global growth companies? And, and we've got both experience in that respect from very established companies as well as some newer growth companies, and then we've got some, some other perspectives perhaps from, from Kevin. But, I'd like to start first with Ben and, uh, and ask you, Ben, to kick off about the DNA. What, what is it that, that drives growth, either within your company, obviously BT, a very established company, or what you've observed and what advice you have for some of the emerging growth companies that are here? And I know you've had some discussions this week around that. Yeah, so let's leave the advice for a moment. Okay. Uh, we're here to, to dialogue. Um, there are two ways to look to growth. The first one is the need to change, and the other one is the need to create. And there's a big difference between the one and the other. So if you look to the DNA of organizations, the willingness to look to the reality of the markets they operate in, um, the willingness of organizations to look in the mirror and see what they do right and what they do wrong, are the components of change and that's difficult enough but then there is something that is extraordinarily more difficult but also more attractive because the reward is higher and that's the ability to create and basically what you need to do for that is to break the mold so to be able to break the fundamentals on which you have based your assumptions and start from scratch now some people are lucky because they start from scratch because they've never done it before and they start and others have to find themselves into a space, sometimes because of a crisis, that they can look and to create. And I think those are fundamental issues. The need to change versus the need to create. Then if you look to organizations, I have three criteria. The criteria that I would say are fundamental for success. The first one is a constant drive for innovation. The second is a constant drive for openness. Now, we all come from a world in which we are very good in what we did, but we did it ourselves. And we didn't work with others, and if we needed to work with others, there was pain. And in, internally in the organizations, you had your stovepipes, and working with others was a kind of a privilege of a CEO to sign a memorandum of understanding, so the rest of the organization got, got a signal not to do it, what was on the piece of paper. So. The ability to be open and flexible with others and create different markets is a very important ingredient. And the last point is that I want to make, it's all about people. And therefore, finding the motivation of people to do things that's not in the DNA. Martin, Ben talks about being creative. Um, that's certainly your business, but you have certainly a lot of groups of businesses within your business. How, how do you drive that in your own DNA and how do you maybe see it in others? Um, well, uh, let me just sort of respond a little bit to, to Ben as well because I think what he said encapsulates a lot of the, the point about the DNA. <clears throat> I think if you're um, one of the, the new champions and just sort of expanding a bit on just identifying the areas you've got to think about, I think the critical area and it answers your second question as well is the vision uh, and the energy uh, of the individual leading the business it, it may be uh, this may be counter to modern management theory and what INSEAD and other business schools um, less distinguished with business schools like HBS uh, are, uh, are, are, are I'm glad you think see things our way no I'm just being nice are pontificating about but um, I, I really think an individual and an individual's vision uh, and energy is the critical determinant. But there are other areas, and if one looks at the material that the HBR 
uh, have put together with the WEF, the Harvard Business Review put together with the WEF, there are three areas that, 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 that the area that Ben mentioned, talent, absolutely critical, organizational structure, which gets to Frank question, Frank's question about organic growth versus acquisition, marketing, I'm not being uh, self-centered self here or talking my own book, it is clear from the data that the new champions regard marketing and branding as being critically important, technology and finance, I think those are the areas. Now, on, on Ben's point, I think innovation is critical, that comes in the technology area, but I would say that differentiation is critically important as well. So that sort of background. Um, there are two things that we're worried about at WPP, and I think that are common to all companies. One is the geographical growth issue here in China. It's critically important for us in our industry to dominate or certainly have a very strong position in the Chinese market and Asia and Latin America and Africa and Middle East and Central and Eastern Europe. And the second thing is responding to, to, to technology and the change that is driving uh, our business and changing the way that consumers consume media. On the question of structure, uh, because there are diseconomies of scale in a creative business, in other words, our client's perception and our people's perception is the bigger you get, the worse it gets. We can debate whether that's true or not, but that's their perception. We have deliberately grown with a multi-branded structure, and that is very difficult to manage. A company that grows by acquisition and has a multi-branded structure, in my view, is the most complicated model. The most, I think, simple and strong model, and it may sound strange coming from me, having been involved in building a business from scratch to over 22 years to a, to a 100,000 people operation in 106 countries, but the most, the strongest model is a unibranded model that grows organically. That, however, is a model that takes the longest period of time to grow. Uh, Yuan Xing, let me turn to you. You have uh, certainly adopted a bit of an acquisition strategy on, on top of some of the things that, uh, that Martin was talking about. How, how is that working out and, and what do you think it's going to take to move that forward even further? Uh, <coughs> 我, uh, 第二个的话呢这个发展的要求来进行调整这样子的一个阶段相匹配的机遇所以你首先的话呢在做这些大规模的这些消费性的这样子的这个产品
啊。那么，对于这个现在的这个企业来说，可能最重要的一个核心竞争力就是它的业务模式啊。你怎么样子做业务？你怎么样子这个这个组织？怎么样子的这个呃，构建你的组织，构建你的这个流程啊？而这一点的话呢，就是跟第三点这个相关系的，就是你必须要，因为现在的话呢，对于任何一个企业，不管你是小企业也好，大企业也好，你是中国的企业也好，本地的企业也好，还是 global 的这个企业也好，你可你都可以在全球的范围内来配置你的资源，啊，那么这就呢要求一个企业的话，你你有能力去最好的去以最好的方式来配置你的资源，对吧？把你的市场放在这个。啊，美国把你的这个研发放在日本，把你的这个服务放在印度，把你的制造放在中国，是吧？那么这些资源进行配置以后，然后建立合理的流程，把这些资源给它串在一起，最后用很好的 IT 系统，对吧？来把它这个固化下来，啊，所以这样子的话呢，就使得你能够在全球范围内，啊，来构筑一个更加有效的业务模式。那么高效率的这个业务模式，更有竞争力的业务模式，所以我认为这三点，啊，战略眼光、核心竞争力和这个全球范围内的资源配置，这是这个新型的这个成长型的企业啊应该所具有的三个核心三三个要素。谢谢。Very, very good. I, I heard three fundamental elements, and I and I also heard take over the world in there too. So.、Uh... <laughs> you heard it here first, folks.、Um, excellent, thank you. Just picking up on the core competency point, Peter. When we were talking before,、um, you were、uh, a little bit self-deprecating and talking about your relatively boring company in your in your own mind.、Um, I think it's maybe I think I know what your core competency is, but talk a little bit about that and talk about how you turn this、uh, relatively. Boring company, as you describe, into、uh, the great success. Well, the reason I say、uh, we're a relatively boring company is we do very simple things. We move stuff from A to B, and that's relatively simple.、Um, it's just the world is so big, which makes it occasionally somewhat complex. But、uh, to the words that Ben said, that there is、uh, a difference between the need to change and the requirements to change. And、uh, the requirement or the need to create, I would add a third layer, and that's the requirement to survive. Because in some of the boring businesses, like Post, in which we are、um, active, there is a real threat of substitution by new technologies, a move for liberalisation, where new competitors coming in and attacking your core business. So there is then a real pressure to survive and to build new businesses、uh, on the back of that.、Um, I agree with Ben that it's all about people,、uh, and, the, and, and that's a statement that we easily make. But I think that means you need to find the right people at the right place because you need completely different profiles of people for different life cycles of products or different markets. So you need local talent, and that drives me to another point that I don't really believe in global growth. You can grow globally. But you're going to have to do it multi-locally or multi-regionally, and find different people for each of these sectors. And then the the most recent lessons that we've learned in our company, which probably drove it from being boring to slightly more sexy, is that if you really focus on、uh, CSR, the sustainability of what you're doing, you're going to tap into a whole new source of energy in your company,、uh, whether it's the fight against global warming. Or the fight for, against hunger, it will motivate your staff in a way that your core business could never ever have done, and it will attract talent that would never ever before have considered working for a boring transport company, like the one in our case. And I think CSR is slowly, but very certainly, moving from a stage where we all try to avoid making mistakes. To proactively us all trying to do good things for the world, and that loads companies with an energy that will make them grow much faster than just traditional strategies would have allowed you to do. Kevin,、uh, using you as the people expert, can you pick up on the CSR point and and how that is is motivating people today? Well, if、uh, sure, if you if you look at organizations today. 
Statistically, it's proven that organizations where employee morale is high are 40 percent more productive than their competitors. So going back to um, Peter's point about attracting talent, it's much easier to attract talent to an organization where morale is high, employee morale is high, and they're having fun. Because at the end of the day, we're all working 18, 24 hours you know, a day today given Blackberries and technology. So individuals are more apt to go to organizations where they can have fun, they can learn, and they can engage because money isn't the consistent driver we're seeing globally to get individuals to move. In fact, it's only 30% of individuals who move for compensation. 30% 30, 30 of individuals move for compensation. We talked about this before, and, and a lot of the topics that we've talked about these few days are, are around the, the war for talent, and I think that's, that's a point worth repeating. People always think it's, it's all about the money, but the fact is study after study says it's not about the money. It's about the organization. And, and Martin, what's, what's your take on what's well, really driving it? That, that's particularly the case because if you look at key trends, the demographics are all against us in terms of the supply of talent. The supply of population, uh, even in countries such as China, and high growth companies such as uh, countries such as Mexico, all the demographic statistics show that the supply birth rates are falling, family sizes are falling, working women are becoming more and more prevalent for good reasons, and all is it, and medical uh, of course medical advances mean we all live longer, so that the supply of young people of talent and recruits uh, is being more and more limited. So the key in our view the key differentiator between companies will be their ability to attract, picking up on Kevin's point, retain, motivate, incentivize, keep talent, and picking up on Peter's point, CSR, which intuitively, it seems to me, anybody who's building a long-term business, and the, the key determinant is long-term. If you're there for the quick buck, obviously, you may not be interested in CSR, but anybody who wants to build long-term brands, motivate consumers to buy your products because we have data to show that particularly amongst young people they are more they are more in love with a brand or more attracted to a brand or product and service if the company or the brand is environmentally correct or in, involved in order to attract employees this is an intangible way of doing it so the war for talent is something that is going to differentiate companies and going back to the vision thing the ability of people to motivate people internally to explain strategic and structural change internally to their people that is another critically important factor and motivating factor for for people uh, the biggest issue inside WPP and I would say inside our clients too is the inability of people to cooperate and if you're going to build global organizations uh, and global brands on scale, you have to get people to cooperate and work together. And the silos that we face, either by brand or by function or by geography, frankly, uh, I think debilitates our own company, frankly, and our clients' companies in many instances. If the CEOs of the, some of the companies that we deal with Obviously, the clients that we work with on this, this platform are excluded from that. They all work seamlessly, perfectly together. But I can assure you that other companies do not. That if they, they worked more effectively together, they would be more productive, more competitive, uh, and more successful. Ben, did you want to comment that you work seamlessly with Martin or something else? We certainly don't work seamlessly. <laughs> and that would also spoil the relationship if we would do uh, a seamless job. No, seriously, I think there are a number of issues here that are truly important, and they're all about the new world. First of all, talent has no passport. And we still think that we have to locate talent based on our local requirements. But Globalization 2.0 has done something phenomenally impactful, and probably not impactful for the people in this audience, but certainly for the young people of the next generation, because it has made possible to be a seamless participant into a logical process without being physically in proximity. So you can sit 
somewhere here in China and be fitted in perfectly as if you sit next next, next door with somebody in the US or in Latin America or in Europe. And that means that you can create an environment in which the best will work with the best regardless their location. You do not have to ask the people to move a continent, to move thousands of miles, to cooperate and collaborate. So the ability to organize collaboration around talent and not talent around collaboration is a massive factor for change. And in addition to that, I think absolutely Martin is right that the most important obstacle for success sits in your own organization and their definition of success. Now, I will exclude everybody in this audience, but in my company, my biggest problem is that their definition of success is to please the boss, not to please the customer. A good day is when the boss says it's okay, not so much when a customer is saying it. And that in itself colors the ability to work together because their definition of success, whatever I say, whatever we say here on the podium is, well, that's what I say for the PR effect. But in reality, my boss will determine my future and therefore to hell with the rest. And that's the problem. But go back to Martin's point about vision. What, what is that? Are they not responding or not focusing on the vision? Sure. They're just focusing more locally? No, no, they, 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 they are responding to vision and change is happening. But if you look to what Martin was saying, do we maximize our ability given the talent that we have in organizations? If we would only get people to believe that we really, truly would embrace the fact that the external effect is what we're after, we would be so much more, more efficient than we are today. I mean, the criti just responding, the, the critical issue is, uh, I think, is time. Uh, companies that grow by acquisition, and as I say, multi-branded, have a much more difficult structure. It is no accident, in my view, that, that high-class professional service organizations, let's give you two examples, McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. are very successful because they have very strong internal cultures that have been developed over many years, uh, they, careful recruitment, constant recruitment of the best people, constant focus on HR. Where they've made acquisitions, J. Aaron, for example, in the case of Goldman Sachs, or ISG, Information Service Group, in the case of McKinsey, they have not been terribly successful where they've had difficulties. These strong internal cultures reject. The problem is it takes time. And this day and age, you know, we started WPP 20 years ago with two people in one room, and I wanted to be involved in building a major company within my lifetime. I didn't want to be dead and buried when, when it had happened. And the question is time. We all want to do things more quickly, particularly in a globally linked world with the challenges we face, and it's very difficult to do quickly. So it militates against this strong internal culture. Just to share with all of you, we, we suggested inside before that it's possible that Martin only met the absolute greatest people at McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, but I didn't <laughs> want to color the conversation. Um, just, just going back to the vision point, and uh, Yuan Xing, you, you mentioned vision and you, you talked about core competencies, allocation of resources, and vision. How well is the vision understood in your organization, and, and how key is the articulation of that vision to your success? Uh, absolutely. This uh, is Talent, uh, with a vision, uh, 其实这个病故以后的话呢这个他们是处于一个非常困难的一个状态
承担这样子的一个风险，啊，和我一起的话呢，啊，去做这么样子一个大的这个并购，因为的话呢，他们希望啊，这个联想能够成为一个国际化的公司，一个全球化的这样子的一个公司，那么希望呢，他们自己的话呢。也能够在这个舞台上，从一个本地的领导人能够成长为一个国际化的领导人、全球化的这样子的领导人。所以，正是这样子的一个微信的话呢，在支持着我们这样子的一个一个团队，啊。那么，当然，对于我们的这些这个国际的同事，从 IBM PC 这边过来的同事的话呢，他们也要看到这个公司的这个这个 vision 是什么，对吧？这个是不是这个会很有发展，啊？这个。当然，也包括的话呢，这个公司的股票能不能增长，是吧？他们在这地方的话呢，这个能不能有很好的这个收益，对吧？所以，如果你不把这些 vision 能够告诉他的话，是吧？那么，啊、呃，其实是很难保留这样子的一些一些人才的，对吧？那么，联想我们之所以在这桩并购中的话呢，做的比较好，我认为的话呢，就是对不同的这个啊、呃呃、员工，我们有，我们都有这个这个相对应的这个沟通，对吧？对于我们的这个国际的同事，对吧？我们让他看到，啊，我们合在一起，我们的这个竞争力是什么？我们的协同效应是什么？是吧？而且我们真正的把它实现，公司的股票涨了，那么大家的话呢，就幸福。所以这就是这个 vision 的这个价值。I think the other points that you're making in addition to the vision is the importance of communication. And the importance of building trust, and that's another thing that we talked a little bit about. So I don't know if anybody wants to pick up on that, but I think trust is a huge issue. Peter, you want? To? I, I I tend to think that uh, the role of the CEO, and you can broaden that to the, the board of management or the top executives in the company, is once the vision is established, once the strategy has been set, you need to spend as much time communicating that internally as you do to your shareholders on road shows and otherwise. So. We tend to go out to every business unit, which in our case is in 63 countries, once a year at least to en engage in a dialogue with our top management to explain the strategy, to get feedback on how it locally would impact the, the operations, and to basically take the local management out of their day-to-day short-term pressures. Because that's the one thing I would want to add to the dialogue so far. Of course, it's about can we make our organizations work better together to create opportunities that are otherwise blocked. But many of the organizations I see also struggle with a short-term focus on either the next quarterly results or this year's budget or my bonus for the period. Whereas if you cannot break them out of that short-termism, you're not ever going to create a growth environment in your culture because growth by definition will last more or take more than a quarter or an annual budget. And I think just to make this panel uh, a little more confused <laughs> than we already might be, there is a very, very strange thing happening in the world today because on this stage you find a bunch of guys who are all in agreement. It's about talent. Talent can be better motivated by CSR. And if we work better together, we're going to grow faster. Well, if that's true, then why the hell has private equity taken off the way it does? Mm -hmm. Because these people are only interested in short-term in, in impact, and any private equity acquisition I've seen happen has immediately killed every CSR program again. So these seem to play by completely different rules. Mm -hmm. You want to comment on private equity, Martin? Well, I, you know, I think you're, you're going against the wind, Peter, because uh, <laughs> for the reasons that you just said, and you talk about short-term, you know, all of us who run a publicly listed company, uh, and I, I enjoy it, I think it's fun, I think dealing with teenage scribblers as our chancellor in the UK once described them it is challenging, uh, whether they be media or, or analysts. <laughs> but the short term is here whether we like it or not. We've just seen the disturbances, the liquidity disturbances in the market. One hopes it's a blip, but it may be something more significant. We have to see, and that's one. But every... 60% or 50% of volume on the London and New York stock exchanges is conducted by hedge funds. All the so-called long-term institutions, long institutions, have quarterly performance targets. We ourselves have quarterly reporting. It's inevitable. And I sort of take a different view. I think the attractions of private equity are very strong. 
It's a reaction to all the legislation and regulation that we've had to deal with post the 2000-2001 Internet 2.0 bust and the fraud, frauds that we saw. We saw it in 1929 after the Great Crash. The regulation that was put in, Glass-Steagall and everything else, caused a regulatory uh, um, mess that had to be dealt with then in the same way that we're having to deal with the regulations, excessive regulations, that always come after a recession. But my view is, uh, from what I hear from the people who, who work with Blackstone or KKR or Carlisle, for example, is that they relish the opportunity because in a closed environment, they get more opportunity to do the long-term things that they can do. And I think one of the things we're going to see uh, in the future is there are going to be more long, longer-term funds. The average private equity fund is a five-year fund with a five-year time frame to unwind and two-year flexibility. So the average is around 12 years. I think there is one fund that's being brought together that will be 25-year fund. I think the trend will be to longer term. And I think the issue that you're raising is a critical one for public listed companies. Why be a non-executive on a, a listed company? What's the, 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 the risk-reward ratio? It's terrible. And also the same thing in the case of being a manager or a, an, an executive, where the rewards in private equity are considerably greater, both intangibly and, and tangibly. So I think it's a serious issue. And despite what's happening in, private, in, the, in the liquidity markets or the financial markets, I think private equity is here to stay and to stay in a more and more significant way. I, I can't tell how many private equity folks are in the audience, but you know, a global growth company on the stage, <laughs> all of them, and we start talking about private equity, you guys must be happy. Um, we'll, we'll get to that in the Q&A. Ben, you had, wanted to make a comment? Yeah, because we talk about basically a relationship with shareholders, and shareholders could be a fund or could be the, 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 the public in general. I, I think if you look to the relationship of, of, of a company, whether it's a small company or a big company, there are four relationships, and there's a logic, and I think CSR fits in that logic. So let me walk you through the, very quickly through the logic. First of all, your customers. What do you do? You do customer satisfaction, customer service. That's what you do to your customers. Then you do your shareholders. You pay dividends, and you make sure that you listen to them. And I disagree with Martin, because it isn't that all of a sudden, if you have a, 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 a private equity fund, that that is a different behavior. It is closed-door behavior, but it's the same behavior. They want dividends, and they want maximization, as, as the other shareholders also want. So you pay a dividend to your shareholders. And then you look to your employees, and you want to have a relationship with your employees that they get identification and therefore motivation. And that's what you do in, in, in care results. And then you have the ability to, the license to sell in societies. We operate in, in over 100 countries. We need to earn the right to be there. And the only way I know to do that is corporate social responsibility. So it's those four elements. You go to a society and say, I want to sell to you. Well, you do something. You go to customers and say, I want to sell to you. Well, you do something. You say to your employees, I want you to give you your all you have. You do something. And you say to the shareholders, I want your money. You do something back. That is, to me, a balanced view. You know, just one more question for the panel. Um, we talked about sustainability. The question I have is the sustainability of the growth strategy. How do you maintain it? Don't you get tired? Don't we thought, talked a little bit about succession out there before. How important is that to the strategy? Anybody want to take that one on? Can I just, uh, it was interesting, we've talked a lot about the uh, war for talent tonight. And the good news is uh, I believe the war for talent's over. Over? Talent won. And talent won, if, you know, back to Barton's point, if you look at the demographics over the next few years, and this feeds into your question about succession, you have... 45% of the baby boomers retiring in North America. Over the next 20 years, you'll have 75 million less Europeans, 65 million less Japanese. We all know the challenges we have in terms of recruiting in this part of the world. The flip side of that is you have a whole generation coming through, Generation Y, that is reputed to have 14 jobs by the time they're 38. So what can we do as organizations to focus on succession planning? And the top of both CEOs' minds today is what are we going to do when we have this frequent turnover every two years among those that are growing in the organization? 
And if you look at um, a career path today, there's three criteria that actually individuals look for. One is obviously interest in what you're doing, whether it's financial services or marketing or uh, you know, in an industrial or automotive firm. Two is compensation, and we touched upon this earlier. When I talk about compensation, I mean being treated fairly. And the third and the most important is learning. And what we need to provide for individuals today is the ability to learn. Because when their learning curve flattens out in an organization, that's when they look to the outside. So that'll help us long term with succession planning. And like you mentioned Slumberger earlier today. Those organizations that give exposure to individuals in different lines of business every two to three years have a better chance at developing internally the future leaders of the organization. Those who don't are going to be challenged to do so. Fair right. sure enough. Ben, you want to comment just one more on, on the uh, concept of tired growth companies? Yeah, well, there is. Um let, let, let's take Martin's organization. It's, it's really an admirable organization. No, I, I, I really mean it. It's yeah, a, this is what is known as beating up on your agency. <laughs> that's part of the process. And, and that's, At least we're getting paid. And that's, make, and that's making sausage in public, right? So let's try to do it. So it's an admirable organization. And, and I am a multi layer customer of, of what's happening in his organization. But let me there, no doubt about it. Every one of his units knows who's the boss, and that's him. So he is the heart and the soul. That's what he does for the company. He protects the soul of the organization. So it's an interesting question. Is the life after, after Martin for the organization? And I think many of the, of the uh, iconic type of leaders have that problem. But also, more managerial type of leaders will have that problem. Because you are a custodian of the here and now, whether you like it or not. And somebody else will say, we need to change. And you are in the way of change by your way of thinking, and how much you, you like to think of yourself as a change agent, you're a change agent within your own dynamics. So I think the challenge has to be to open up for challenge every day, to be willing to face challenge, to willing to have people challenging you in whatever you do from day one. And that requires an, 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 a kind of perspective of fun by being challenged. I believe that organizations who have uh, let's say the leader in a know-all and hope-for-all type of approach are the companies that are getting tired and therefore lose growth. I think leaders in organizations that are challenging are leaders that also know when the time is to push the button. Which button am I going to push? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let, can we'll can let I, Martin have a, a, counter, a counterpoint a to his client yeah. and then uh, we'll go to the floor. Yeah, please. Yeah, can I, uh, well, if you think logically about what Ben, and I, and I agree with uh, a lot of what he says, I have to because he's a client. Um, but if, if, um, if you think about logically, this would argue against founder uh, or first generation companies. And there are two distinct skills, and I think this is very important for, for new champions. The firstly is the skills of initiating and building a company. And the second is a set of skills to run that company once it's, once it's been built. It is true, to Ben's point, that there are very few people who've been able to build, in initiate, build, and then run a significant company. It is two different sets of characteristics. Create and change. Yeah, create and change. Exactly yep. right. Yep. Exactly right. And it's when we started WPP, when I started when I was 40 years old, so male menopause I was going through, andropause, um, the objective was to start a company, build a company, and then run it. And that's very, very difficult to do. Now, the person who succeeds me would probably more likely to come from within the company than from outside, given what we were talking about outside. The person who succeeds me will never run the business in the same way. Because somebody who starts a business, there's a famous quote, from, and I can mention Liverpool Football Club here, uh, Bill Shankly from Liverpool, who said, football is not a matter of life and death. It is more important than that. WPP is not a matter of life and death. It is more important than that. I take everything in relation to WPP personally because we started 20 years ago, two people in one room. The person who succeeds me will never, may do it better, probably will do it better, but will never have the same attitude. It's true. But that same theory of create and change goes for the next generation as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So, um, 
I'm, I'm conscious that we've got a short panel, and I want to go to questions from the floor, if that's okay with everyone, to, uh, to make sure we get, uh, and I see there are some already. Uh, if you could just uh, say who you are and uh, address your question either to an individual or I'll parse it. Th thank you. My name is Reza Jafari. I'm chairman of New Star International and also chairman of the ITU, a UN agency. Uh, companies were not born with an N DNA inherently for growth. I believe leadership either creates that DNA and sometimes alters the DNA. The case in hand is Ben and Sir Martin. Ben was given an, an organization that the DNA was not customer-centric, but he turned it around. He altered that DNA to become not customer-centric. Sir Martin has a different challenge now. He has to find his successor, but he's also taking WPP to the digital age. What are the one or two things that you have to do or you had to do in order to get where you are? Um, the organizational structure issues of, uh, of in, in the context of digital change is, uh, I think, the critical issue. Uh, I, I describe two challenges for our companies. Come back to the question that Frank raised about strategy for growth companies. The two issues I think will continue to be, for the foreseeable future, two sets of issues. Geographical, so how do we position WPP? It's 25, 23% in Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Central East Europe. I want it to be a third. How do we get to that, at least? And the second thing is technology. 23% of our business, by coincidence, is digital in our view. I want it to be at least a third, because consumers are spending at least 20% of their time online. Those are the two critical issues. How do we do it? Geographical things, people understand. They see Dalian. They see the Beijing Olympics. They'll see the Asian Games in Guangzhou in 2010, Expo in Pudong in 2010, they get that. They see India, they get that. They see Brazil, Russia, they get that. That's relatively easy. Understanding the digital change is very different. The digital change, by its nature, is very much more demanding and dangerous because what it does is disintermediates and destroys traditional businesses. It's very difficult when you have a traditional business to get people, and we, we've been in existence for 22 years, and JWT will shortly celebrate its 150th anniversary. People who've been around for 150 years have a mindset and an attitude which is very different to a company that's been around for 22 years. Changing that is very difficult. And directly to your point, what do we do? We create, because people never change fast enough in established organizations, and because, and because people with white, clean sheets of paper organizations always change faster, you have to create, in my view, a separate vertical in your organization to stimulate change. And therefore, what we've done at WPP is create WPP Digital, which is making the investments, creating the sort of grit in the oyster to create the pearl to get our people to move fast enough. And the sign of success will be when we disband WPP Digital because our existing organizations have digitized themselves in the most effective way. Very good. Ben, you want to comment quickly? Yeah, I'll do it quickly. First of all, you need a sense of urgency. And in BT's case, that was very easy because we had a crisis. If you have 30 billion pounds in debt, then the sense of urgency is, is easy. And if there's a sense of urgency, then the rest becomes relatively easy. I think leadership does only three things. You set the agenda, you set the tone, and you choose the right people. So if you set the right agenda, and you create the right tonality in the organization, that's, let's say, the, the fabric of an organization. How do we deal with each other? And you choose the right people and be pretty radical in that. By being clear in, the right, in, in, in your choices about the right people, you can make change happening very fast. Good. Next question. Go ahead. Sorry. Yep. My name is Alvaro Rodriguez. I run a social investment firm out of Mexico. And I also chair Action International, which is a non-for-profit out of the U.S. and a pi global pioneer in microfinance. My question is about CSR. Some of you have mentioned that CSR is an important part in the DNA of companies. But uh, two things. One is, how do you define CSR? Because there's a wide definition of this. And two, how do you insert it 
as part of the DNA of a corporation. Thanks. Peter, you want to lead with that one, please? Uh, sure. Uh, the de definition is a rather broad one. It's um, the impact your organization has on societies and how to limit or proactively improve uh, that impact to the minimum in case of CO2. But it, it's, it's rather wide in stretches into how you treat your people, into health and safety, into what can you do for philanthropy uh, and uh, in, in a sense that it's logical and a good fit uh, with the things you do as a company. Um, how do you ensure it becomes part of your DNA, a part of your organization? It's simply by thinking about it in the same way as you run your business. Uh, I'm running a transport company. Transport companies by nature uh, push out a lot of CO2 emissions. It comes out of the exhaust pipes of our trucks and our planes. So we've simply decided to start the accounting for CO2 in exactly the same way as we are accounting for the financials. Same systems, same consolidation, same quarterly reporting, same annual outlook, same transparency in where it gets to the improvement programs that we're putting against it, and the same bonus schemes to incentivize people to go where we think they need to go. And if you run CSR that business way, business like way, it's going to be as successful as running your ordinary business. I, I would just add for what I do for a living now at, at INSEAD. I can tell you that the most important club for the 900 MBAs a year that come through INSEAD is the Social Responsibility Club. The most uh, sought after electives are those that deal with that topic. So to the extent that the next generation comes out of business school, um, it, it's something that no organization can afford to ignore. Can we have another question? There's one right in the middle, and then here and then here. Yeah, uh, Pradeep Gupta from Cyber Media India. Uh, in terms of the new champions, some of the new champions are emerging from the, the digital age. And what would be the key DNA differentials of such companies? You know, how would Google DNA be different from any of the other companies which are sitting here on the dais? Anybody want to take that one on? Well, well, well just um, one of the the frightening things about the new technology DNA is their market power. I mean, if I look at Google, Google is uh, 150 billion market cap, had revenues last year almost the, exactly the same as ours, and our market cap is about $18 billion. If I take the top four companies in our industry and add up, add up their combined market cap is $50 billion, and their combined revenues are 33 billion. So Google has a third of the revenue, or last year did, this year will be slightly different, a third of the revenue and three times the market cap of the top four companies. So the, I think, the, and Microsoft is a $300 billion company, and I mentioned those two because we, we recently made an acquisition of 24-7 Real Media, which takes us in to the application of technology for the first time, and takes us, if not head-to-head, -head, certainly competitively, into that, in the spaces that Google, or some of the spaces that Google and Microsoft occupies. So I think the most daunting thing is not just the disintermediation issue, but the market power issue, the public market power issue that they have, and the market power that they continue to have. Their challenge, I believe, both from Microsoft and Google, is that they have become almost old companies, mature companies now. The biggest challenge for Google and Microsoft is how they, change, they face the changes in the future. And I remember that Michael Eisner was asked in 1997, when he was at Disney, what did he worry about? And he said, a PhDs in a garage in Silicon Valley. If you ask me what do I worry about now, it's the PhDs in Beijing and Bangalore mm -hmm. that will cause the same disruption. And I think it's the market power that they will have and create, create that will cause issues for Google and Microsoft in the future. Before you, Ben, but Martin, just to follow up, buying 24 by 7, does that change your DNA, bring you closer to Google? Well, uh, the valuation issue means that we can't take on a life-threatening issue. Uh, both Microsoft and Google, uh, Google hasn't had regulatory approval for DoubleClick, but Microsoft has for Aquantive, 
the relative figures are exactly the same. Neither, com neither of the three, any of the three companies have done anything on a life-threatening basis because the valuations involved are so high. And this is one of the things about the digital space which is so difficult for a traditional company in that you have to invoke the word strategic when you announce the acquisition. And we all know that every CEO that talks about a strategic acquisition is to dry, trying to gloss over some short-term financial issues in terms of equity dilution. Okay. One, quick, go ahead, Kevin. I was going to say one, one challenge they'll have going forward. It's interesting, I saw the statistic yesterday that 26% of the population will actually work for Google. And the challenge, and we had spoken about this earlier, is how do they maintain that entrepreneurial spirit within the organization? Because most traditional companies, as Martin referred to earlier, we get tied up in bureaucracy. So you look for that entrepreneurial spirit in these organizations, and that's a challenge that you're seeing right now with Google as they continue to grow, Microsoft, et cetera. Okay, Ben? Well, we have to, uh, it's a very interesting question that you ask about the digital space, because if you look to market capitalization, it's all based on expectations. You know, there was one day that um, the expectation of Cisco was that it would be bigger in market cap than the whole of the economy of the US. Uh, I looked at the numbers that you had in 1999. And the, that was all based on expectations, so the same here. So if you want to maintain that, the speed of growth and the speed of change needs to go exponentially up. Now, it's a choice to be in that space. It doesn't mean that if you are in different space that you make the wrong choice. So I'm not so sure that we all should aspire to be in that, in that space. You sure might get tired being there, too. Uh, okay, we have time for one more. We have one here. Go ahead, please. Hello, this is Li Fen Wang from CCTV. My question uh, is to the gentleman from WPP. Uh, uh, would you please uh, clarify the difference, uh, the difference of DNA between the past company and the recent company or digital company or on the cutting edge company? This is one question. I have another question to Yuan Yuan Xin Xianxiang. 啊、uh, ，那我觉得联想在中国呢，实际上有两代成功的企业家，一个是柳传志先生带领的原来的老的联想的集团哈，那么现在杨元庆先生就率领一个新的联想集团，这两个大的公司在运行过程中，你觉得你们成功的 DNA 是相同的吗？还有哪些不同的东西是我们新一代应该能够学习的呢 ？OK， 谢谢。First, we're going to have、uh, Mr. Yang Xing、uh, quickly one one minute. <laughs> 呃，我说，我觉得呢，这个呃，有相同的地方呢，也有这个呃不同的地方。比如说的话呢，这个呃，需要有这个呃战略的眼光啊。那么这个的话呢，这个毫无疑问的话呢，这个呃是比较相相近，对吧？那么其实我刚才讲的这个前面两点都是比较相近，有战略眼光，要有这个呃建立自己的核心竞争力啊。那么也有不同的这个地，就是在刘总的那个时代的话呢，联想还是一个这个本地的这个企业，是吧？那么可能呢，这个我们呃立足于这个这个叫 organic 的，就自我的这个发展的话呢，这个就可以发展的很好，对吧？但我们今天的话呢，是一个全球化的企业，国际化的企业，对吧？那么在这样子的这个情况下面，对吧？我们的这个呃。发展的要求可能就不一样，比如说这个并购就应该成为我们的需要建立的一个新的这个核心的这个竞争力的这个地方，啊啊，通过这种跨越式的发展来发展自己的企业。那么同时的话呢，这个要进行这样子的一个呃跨越式的发展，可能人才的需求的话呢，也就是不一样。过去我们只是这个本地的人才就可以。但是我们现在的话呢，刚才大家都谈到很多，人才是非常重要的，在我们这地方的话呢，也是有非常切身的这个体会。所以我们这个并购到目前为止之所以能够取得比较好的这个结果的话呢，就是根据跟呃这个我们呢这个注意利用全球的这个资源，我刚才讲的全球的资源，全球的这个人才啊是分不开的。那么实际上今天联想的话呢，在我们的这个 top 呃这个头二十位这个管理层里边，我们来自于十个国家。所以这个大概是任何的一个所谓的这个国际化的公司的话呢，啊，这个都不同。所以这些的话呢，大概就是我们这个需要啊建立新的竞争力的地方。
不同的地方。谢谢。Um, just very quickly, uh, the, let me put it like this. We know that the consumers in the world spend 20% of their time currently online, mobile search and the like. We also know that the average amount of budgets that our clients spend online is 8% worldwide. Why is that? It's because people basically, clients, media owners, traditional media owners, and agencies are too slow to change. And that's natural human behavior. If you've been creating 30-second, 60-second TV ads for 50 years or 20 years, and something comes along, <coughs> search, mobile, which dramatically changes the process and consumer behavior, media behavior, you, there's a resistance to change. And frankly, to be very blunt, those three sets of companies, clients, agencies and media owners are run by people who are, let me put it politely, are more mature. Mature but not senile. And they are people who will not change rapidly. I think the true change comes with the next generation. So in a very few years, I think you will see clients spending 20% of their money, their budgets online, maybe even upweighting it because growth will continue. Excellent. Un unfortunately, uh, that is all the time we have. Uh, I think we had an excellent discussion ranging across a lot of topics, but uh, covering certainly WPP from uh, from cradle to today, hopefully and not, uh, and covering a lot of other. Uh, no, no, I didn't say grave, Martin. <laughs> and and covering a lot of other great issues. So please uh, join me in thanking a terrific panel. And thanks to. Uh, Thank you. Thanks to all of you for joining us, and uh, I'd ask you to stay seated, if you will, because there's going to be an announcement about the closing as we exit stage right. Thank you.